that was interesting. Uh, OK. So this week's questions. Um, first one, why do you think that Captain Wentworth's removing Walter from Anne makes her perfectly speechless? So uh, if you remember, this is the scene where uh, they meet at, I believe this is Upper Cross Cottage. Um, and uh, Captain Wentworth is there not talking to her. Uh, and Walter, the young boy of two years old, uh, starts misbehaving. And he began to fasten himself upon her as she knelt in such a way that busy as she was about Charles, she could not shake him off. So Anne is busy taking, uh, I believe she's busy taking care of young Charles Musgrove, who is sick. Um, and so she could not shake off Walter. She spoke to him, ordered, entreated, and insisted in vain. So useless. Once she did contrive to push him away, but the boy had the greater pleasure in getting upon her back again directly. So she did succeed in pushing him away, but then he jumped back on uh, her back. Walter, said she, get down this moment. You are extremely troublesome. I'm very angry with you. Walter, cried Charles Hayter, why do you not do as your bid? Bid means told. Uh, do not you hear your aunt speak? Come to me, Walter. Come to cousin Charles. But not a bit did Walter stir. So uh, nothing doing. It's all useless. He's still uh, grabbing onto Anne. In another moment, however, she found herself in the state of being released from him. Uh, someone was taking him from her, though he had bent down her head so much that his little sturdy hands were unfastened from around her neck. Uh, so he was on her back, but remember he's like two, so he's not like a baby. Um, and his weight had bent down her head. So like uh, he was heavy enough that she can't even lift her head. Uh, his sturdy hands were unfastened from around her neck and he was resolutely borne away. Resolutely here means definitively, absolutely taken away before she knew that Captain Wentworth had done it. Uh, OK, so notice this. Walter is a relative and uh, Anne can't get Walter to, to get off her back. Charles Hayter can't get Walter to get off her back. Uh, and so the person who removes Walter is Captain Wentworth, who is not a relative. Uh, continuing. Her sensations on the discovery made her perfectly speechless. She could not even thank him. She could only hang over little Charles with most disordered feelings. So she doesn't know what to feel. Why? The novel continues. His, Captain Wentworth's, Kindness in stepping forward to her relief. The manner, which means the way that he did it. The silence in which it had passed, which means he didn't first try to call Walter away. He just went directly to pick him up. The little particulars of the circumstance, the details. With the conviction soon forced on her by the noise he was studiously making with the child. So. Uh, after Captain Wentworth plucks Walter away, he fusses over Walter and makes noise uh, fussing over him. And this noise convinces Anne that he, Captain Wentworth, meant to avoid hearing her thanks, didn't want to hear her say thank you, and rather sought to testify to say that her conversation was the last of his wants, produced such confusion, uh, and instead of wanting her thanks, is perhaps giving the impression that he did not want to have a conversation with her. It is the last of his wants. 
want here means something that he might want. So if he takes a list of everything that he wants, then the last thing on the list would be to have a conversation with Anne. And Anne thinks this because he is busy trying to uh, making noise with Walter and therefore trying not to have to talk to her. So this entire situation, uh, all of these things, his kindness, the silence, the noise, produce such a confusion of varying but very painful agitation. Uh, all of these things put together made her feel confused and agitated, which means unsettled. Uh, uh, like I guess me emotionally in Chinese, this would be like uh, and this agitation is painful. All of these emotions within her that she could not recover until enabled by the entrance of Mary and the Miss Musgroves, Louisa and Henrietta, uh, to make over her little patient to their cares and leave the room. So basically uh, what happens is Walter jumps on her back. Nobody can get him off. Captain Wentworth plugs him off and then fusses over him and is very unsettled. Mary and the two Miss Musgroves return and take over the care of little Charles and letting Anne, uh, who now has nothing to do, leave the room. And uh, it is only after she leaves the room that she can face all of these emotions. So back to the original question. Why do you think Captain Wentworth's removing Walter from Anne makes her perfectly speechless? Well, we just saw that it creates a lot of different and conflicting troublesome emotions in her. The bigger question, therefore, is why does it create so many emotions in her? So first of all, uh, the, the main reason is, of course, because uh, she still loves him. Uh, and so any kind of interaction with Captain Wentworth would cause some kind of powerful emotion within her. But uh, what about the event uh, right before us? Like whatever happens between her and Captain Windworth, she will feel <clears throat> uh, an unsettled emotion. So why this event in particular? Is there something special about this event that causes her such powerful, painful, conflicting emotions? Well, the novel tells us his kindness First of all, even though he there, he afterwards does not try to have a conversation with Anne, but his kindness in doing this in removing Walter. Uh, and it is a kindness because, as I just said, he is not a relative, uh, and so he actually has no duty to order around or to keep uh, in line another family's child. So he, the fact that he does this is an act of kindness. Uh, but he does so in silence, right? He doesn't first try to call Walter away. He just sees what has to be done and he does it. Uh, and so this silence is actually a kind of uh, familiarity, a kind of intimacy. Uh, this is the kind of thing that a family member would do. Someone who presumes that he has the right to order around uh, a child because that child is also a part of the same family. So in fact, oh, this part causes an uh, emotional trouble because it is the action that someone would do if they were family, but Captain Wentworth is not family. And thinking about how Captain Wentworth might be family, of course, reminds her of her past engagement to him and all of that uh, sad uh, business in her past. And so his kindness here contrasted with the fact that he tries to avoid her afterward. So on the one hand, he acts like family. On the other hand, he doesn't want to talk about this. Uh, these two put together make her, um, as it says, perfectly speechless. She doesn't know what to say. Uh, there is no kind of social etiquette or social rule that tells her what she should say in this kind of situation. Uh, not just the fact that Wentworth is not family, but also given the history between him and Anne. Uh, she has no idea what kind what uh, the kind of person who would be in her situation should say at this kind of uh, event. Uh, so that's the first question. Now, I asked this question because uh, it's especially interesting to think about why Captain Wentworth does this. 
Um, we've just talked about this scene from Anne's point of view, uh, but what about Captain Wentworth? Uh, the polite thing, of course, would be to first help to call out to Walter to see if he will listen, and then perhaps uh, to ask permission from a family member, maybe from, well, not Charles Hayter. Charles Hayter is engaged to, uh, I think, Henrietta, right? Uh, but he's not yet part of family. So maybe the polite thing would be for Captain Wentworth to ask Anne for permission to remove Walter from her back. Uh, but he skips over all of this. First of all, of course, he notices that uh, Walter is very heavy and has bent Anne down so that she can't even lift her head. So there is some kind of urgency. But I think the bigger point here is that uh, he he does not feel the very uh, certain need to obey all of the social etiquette in this situation. Why not? Because uh, he had used to be uh, more familiar with Anne. They they were they had used to be on more familiar terms. It's kind of like how um, like uh, if you date someone and later you break up with them uh, and then later like you happen to see each other in a social gathering like a party or like an event. The way that you interact with them is not exactly the same as you would interact with a usual friend because you two used to be more familiar. Uh, you two used to not have to follow all of the social etiquette and social customs. Now, of course, you have to because you're no longer together, uh, but there is still the the habit or perhaps the understanding or perhaps the past experience of not having had to uh, follow social etiquette. So we can say that the fact that Captain Wentworth at this point decides not to follow social etiquette um, reminds Anne that they used to be more familiar, that they used to be engaged. Uh, and on the part of Wentworth, perhaps at this moment, he saw a, a situation of urgency and for a moment he forgot or decided it was less important uh, to follow all of the social rules uh, because it was possible for him before. It's not uh, inconceivable for him, so it happens. But of course, afterwards he realizes he broke etiquette. Uh, he breached etiquette, so that's why he doesn't want to hear from Anne. He doesn't want to hear her say thank you. He doesn't want to have a conversation with her because he now is also embarrassed uh, at reminding her and reminding himself that they used to be engaged. So maybe something like that. A single small action uh, can reflect the long and complicated history between two people. Um, moving on, question two. Louisa says that Mary has a great deal too much of the Elliot pride. Do you agree? Why or why not? If you do agree, can you give some examples? OK, let's look at page 59. Uh, let's see. Louisa spoke again. Mary is good natured enough in many respects said she. Respects means in many uh, aspects, in many dimensions, in many features. But she does sometimes provoke me excessively, so like angers me or makes me want to say something to her by her nonsense and her pride, the Elliot pride. She has a great deal too much of the Elliot pride. We do so wish that Charles had married Anne instead. Ha. So that's kind of interesting. I suppose you know he wanted to marry Anne and she's talking to Captain Wentworth and supposedly. Uh, he doesn't know, so that's also kind of embarrassing. Anyway, back to the question. Uh, she has a great too much of the Elliot pride. First of all, her nonsense. I'm pretty sure we know what that means, right? Always pre not pretending, but like saying that she's sick or doesn't feel well or like needs Anne to take care of her. 
or like complaining about like children, uh, that kind of nonsense. Everyone kind of knows that she's not really that sick. She just uh, has a habit of complaining. Uh, but what about the Elliot pride? We talked a little bit about this, um, I think last week or maybe two weeks ago. The Elliot pride, Sir Walter Elliot is very prideful and vain and selfish. He thinks very highly of himself. He treats himself as the standard of, of beauty and of social standing. Elizabeth Elliot, the oldest daughter, uh, is like her father, also very vain and prideful and thinks highly of herself. Um, Mary Elliot, she does seem to have a bit of pride in her, right? So like uh, there was a there was a moment when here somewhere uh, when they're on their talk and they reach uh, the resting place. Um, see if I can find it. Uh, ah, there we go. Um, they gain the summit of the most considerable hill. Considerable here means high. Uh, which parted up across in Winthrop and soon commanded a full view of the ladder of Winthrop at the foot of the hill on the other side. Uh, Let's see, and and they start sitting down. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, well, first of all, here's one. Uh, so Winthrop is the home of Charles Hayter, the person that Henrietta is probably going to marry. And so when Mary looks at Winthrop and thinks of Charles Hayter, uh, she says to Captain Wentworth, it is very unpleasant having such connections. Uh, but I assure you, I have never been in the house above twice in my life. And the reason it's so unpleasant is because Charles Hayter is also not a noble, he's a commoner. Uh, his only kind of social status comes from the fact that he is, uh, I believe, a parson in training. So he's not a minister. He's training to be a minister or like he's a substitute minister, something like that. So he doesn't even have his own church. Uh, he's simply stepping in for an older deacon, an older minister. Uh, so that's his only social status. He's poor. He's not noble. Um, and so Mary does not think very well of this connection. This uh, the fact that her family knows Charles Hayter. Uh, here we have another example. The brow of the hill, which means the top where they remained, was a cheerful spot. Louisa returned and Mary finding a comfortable seat for herself on the step of a stile. A style is like one of the wooden posts uh, that separates, sorry, a, a wooden post in a fence. So like fences have like long planks of wood between posts and each post is actually called a style. So she found a seat for herself on the step of a style and was very well satisfied so long as the others all stood about her. So she is only satisfied if she's the only person sitting. Also a kind of pride. Uh, but when Louisa drew Captain Wentworth away to try for a gleaning of nuts, to glean means to pick from wild uh, trees or hedges or shrubs. Uh, to try for a gleaning of nuts in an adjoining hedgerow, and they were gone by degrees quite out of sight and sound, Mary was happy no longer. She quarreled with her own seat. Quarrel means to argue. Now, of course, she's not really arguing with her seat. She's, it just means that she keeps complaining about her seat. Oh, I, uh, it's so hard and it's such a bad seat, whatever. She quarreled with her own seat, was sure Louisa had got a much better somewhere. So she's sure that Louisa only left to find a better seat. 
and nothing could prevent her from going to look for a better also. So this is also a good example of her pride. She's happy if she's the only person sitting, but if someone else seems to have found a better seat, she is no longer happy. She has to have the best seat. So yeah, I guess we can say that she does have a bit of the Elliot pride. Even if uh, it's not entirely connected with the beauty part, but at least she thinks that uh, her situation has to reflect her better social standing. OK, uh, next question. Question three. Anne thinks that Captain Benwick is younger than I am, younger in feeling, if not in fact, younger as a man. Do you agree? Why or why not? Might there be someone who is older than Anne? Again, why or why not? So let's take a look at this, page 65. So remember, Captain Benwick is the guy who's staying with the Harvilles. It says here he had been engaged to Captain Harville's sister, Fanny, but Fanny died, right? Fanny Harville. So uh, now Captain Benwick is like uh, a family friend, I guess you could say. Let's see. Ah, so Captain Benwick is still mourning Fanny uh, and he mourns Fanny. He grieves for her in one way by uh, reading lots of poetry and uh, a little bit of prose. We'll get to that later. Here Anne says to herself. And yet said Anne to herself as they now moved forward to meet the party. So two groups are coming together. He has not perhaps a more sorrowing heart than I have, so maybe he's probably as sad as I am. Uh, of course, Anne is sad because um, she didn't get to marry Captain Wentworth, and she's even sadder because now Captain Wentworth has returned to her life uh, and to remind her of how sad she is. Continuing. I cannot believe, sorry, I cannot believe his prospects so blighted forever. Blighted means ruined. Uh, today we use the word uh, when we talk about crops and like plants. If crops and plants are blighted, it usually means that some kind of disease or fungus has made them uh, unable to be eaten or to make them unhealthy and die. So to be blighted uh, is the opposite of to be prosperous or, or blooming. These are both nature metaphors, right? To prosper or to bloom is like a flower opening up or a plant bearing fruit. And to be blighted or to wither, diaowei, is to, to die for a plant, to weaken and die. Uh, so Anne says, I cannot believe his prospects so blighted forever. He, she can't believe that uh, after Fanny's death, he will never ever marry ever again. That's what prospects mean, right? Marriage prospects for the future. Continuing. He is younger than I am. Younger in feeling, if not in fact. So which means he's not actually younger than Anne, like he's older than Anne. But in terms of feeling, he is younger. Younger as a man. And here, of course, the word man doesn't just mean like uh, compared to other men, but like in terms of the relationship between men and women, uh, he is younger, which I guess means like he has less experience. I think that's what that means. Um, right, so that's what it means to be younger in feeling. So feeling here doesn't just mean emotion. It means like experience with feeling. Today we might call this EQ. Uh, qing, qing sang, right? Emotional quotient, the knowledge and ability to deal with feelings or to have experienced different kinds of complicated feelings. And so here she says that he is younger because uh, he has lost his fiancee, Fanny Harville. But Anne not only has lost her fiancee, Captain Wentworth, she lost him for nine years 
And then suddenly Captain Wentworth returned to her life, and so she has to face this. Uh, we could even call him a ghost uh, in her life. So it's much more complicated. The emotions are much more uh, conflicting, not straightforward. Right, Benwick, uh, his feelings are very straightforward. I lost my fiance. I grieve for her. I'm sad. That's it. But Anne uh, is sad and grieving and also surprised and confused uh, and hesitant. Like she's not sure what to do. And also embarrassed like, and awkward, like so many different emotions. So in terms of feeling, even though Captain uh, Benwick is older than Anne, she says that uh, in terms of feeling and emotion, he is younger. Uh, so of course I agree. I wrote the question. Of course I agree. Uh, but the last part of this question three, might there be someone who is older than Anne? So in terms of feelings, might there someone who is more experienced and knows more about what to do than Anne does? Uh, so let's think about the characters we have met so far. First, uh, Sir Walter Elliot. No, no, he's he's very immature. Elizabeth Elliot. No, uh, on top of being as immature as Sir Walter, she's also never been in a relationship before. What about Lady Russell? Well, she does seem more wise, right? A bit wiser, a bit more knowledgeable about what to do. Uh, and she has been in a relationship uh, to, I guess, Sir Russell, whoever Sir Russell was. I don't think we meet him. Uh, on the other hand, the fact that she is traditional, the fact that Lady Russell is so traditional, actually tells us that maybe she herself is not so experienced personally in matters of the heart and emotional experience. Uh, because if you are experienced emotionally, then most of your decisions, uh, social decisions would probably be based on your own experience and your own uh, ideas of based on your experience of what to do. But Lady Russell's decisions are mostly based on the social ideas, the ideas shared uh, by the people in her society. Uh, these are like common ideas, abstract ideas, maybe not necessarily personal ideas. Uh, but we don't know. We'd, we'd never meet Sir Russell, who's dead. We never hear anything about their anything in detail about their marriage. Maybe she does have experience, maybe not. No idea. Moving on, who else do we have? Uh, Captain Wentworth. I'm going to say that he is exactly as old as Anne in terms of emotion. They've been through the same thing together. They are, they are now currently in the same situation together. Uh, so he's probably not older than Anne. Who else? Mary, Mary and Charles. Uh, but of course, Mary is also full of nonsense and kind of immature. Uh, and whatever we have seen of her marriage with Charles Musgrove, it doesn't seem to be a very emotionally deep marriage or relationship. It seems to be just like a normal uh, household where they work together to take care of the children, to fulfill their social obligations, uh, nothing too deep emotionally. And of course, there's no sense of loss. Neither uh, Mary didn't lose someone uh, who she loved before. So not Mary. Who else? Uh, Admiral Croft and Lady Croft. Now this is interesting. They have been together forever. Uh, so there's no sense of loss there. Uh, but being married to, to someone for such a long time and being able to still get along with your spouse after all these years uh, is also perhaps a sign of maturity or like emotional intelligence. If you remember, I'm not going to look for evidence for this, but there is evidence. If you remember, um, it is said that Lady Croft uh, takes part in every decision that Admiral Croft makes. Uh, so they are equals in their marriage. And this is quite unusual. Usually at the time, uh, upper class marriages, the men took care of uh, uh, like the, the more official duties and like career and money and politics, 
and the women took care of the family and social obligations. Remember, we talked about Lady Elliot in the first week. Uh, her uh, ideal wife and ideal mother kind of role, all based on family and social obligations. But Admiral and Lady Croft decide everything together. So, for example, when they were going to rent uh, Kellynch Hall, Lady Croft also helped decide to pick this place and to enter into a rental deal with the Elliots. Moreover, uh, we also see in this week's selection that uh, when they drive about in the country, actually, let's see if I can find this. Uh, what page is this? No, 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 that previous one. Yes. Uh, Ah, yes, so Captain Wentworth is uh, Lady Croft's uh, brother. OK, so from here. What glorious weather for the Admiral and my sister. They're meant to take a long drive this morning. Drive, of course, they don't have a motor car. They have a carriage, a horse and carriage. Perhaps we may hail them. Hail means to, to like say hello uh, to them from some of these hills. So saying, oh, maybe we're on top of these hills. Maybe we'll see their carriage and we can call out to them. Say hello. Continuing, they talked of coming into this side of the country. I wonder whereabouts they will upset today. Now, upset. Uh, notice that I put the emphasis on the first syllable. It's upset, not upset. Uh, this is not an adjective. This is a verb. And it means to turn over. Uh, what to turn over what? Of course, here they're talking about the carriage to turn over the carriage. So basically he's saying he wonders where they will get into an accident today. And uh, uh, as I'm sure you are all surprised, someone uh, that Wentworth is talking to is also surprised. I believe this is Louisa is also surprised. So he says, oh, it does happen very often, I assure you. But my sister makes nothing of it, so which means she doesn't really care. She would as leave be tossed out as not. As leave means rather. She would rather be tossed out as not, which means uh, she doesn't care. Um, so we can see that um, in their marriage, not only are they equal, they also uh, don't care too much about etiquette or about doing way things the proper way. Uh, you know, if they turn over and, and they get into a small accident, uh, they, they think it's it's no big deal. It's kind of fun. It's usual. Uh, and it, the, the novel tells us somewhere else that one of them is a very bad driver. I think it's the Admiral. The Admiral is a bad driver, so it's not just about like accident or no accident. This is also uh, a, a glimpse into their marriage, into their relationship. Lady Croft knows that the Admiral is a bad driver, so whenever they get into an accident because he goes too fast or they turn too fast and they overturn the carriage, she doesn't mind because she knows that this is the person that she married. This is the kind of man who is her husband. I think that's also a kind of emotional maturity, right? Uh, to not ask too much of your spouse or like not to urge them to change who they are. Um, yeah, so even though they have not suffered a loss like Anne, and certainly they have not had to face the fact that the person they lost is now back in their life, uh, I think this is also a sign of being emotionally older. So another way to say this is uh, at the moment of the novel, Anne is very conflicted and confused and feels a lot of powerful emotions. But if she does end up marrying Captain Wentworth and they have a long and happy marriage together, maybe at the end of the or when they're much older, uh, their marriage may look something like this marriage between the Admiral and his wife. So if if that is the case, that tells us that the Admiral's marriage and his relationship with his wife is more mature than Anne's relationship with Wentworth at the moment. It's further developed. It's what Anne and Wentworth hope will happen in the future. 
Uh, so perhaps we can say that they are emotionally older. Uh, OK, next question. If you do have questions, uh, feel free to ask or like leave something in the chat. Uh, I'll be checking once in a while. OK, next question. How would you describe Anne's understanding of the uses of poetry and prose? Do you agree? Why or why not? OK. So as I mentioned, uh, Captain Benwick is grieving in one way by reading a lot of poetry. So they, uh, he and Anne get into a discussion about this uh, because Anne, who is usually ignored at home, uh, has a lot of free time and so probably reads a lot. Uh, Let's see. So uh, Benwick is grieving and Anne hopes as usual to be of some use to be able to help him in some way. So she talks with him. And they begin by talking poetry. Hang on, where is this? Um, Yeah, there we go. OK, there we go. So they get to start to talk and uh, he, Captain Benwick, was evidently judging by appearance. Evidently means judging by the evidence and the evidence is, of course, the appearance, the conversation, things that Anne can see. So he was evidently a young man of considerable taste in reading. Though uh, so considerable taste means a uh, good taste though principally in poetry, so he mainly reads poetry. And besides the persuasion of having given him at least an evening's indulgence in this discussion of subjects, uh, so they had already, hang on, uh, she had already let him uh, choose the topic of their conversation for this evening. Which is probably reading. Now notice here the word persuasion. The persuasion of having given him at least an evening's indulgence in the discussion of subjects. So persuasion usually means to try to change someone's mind, but actually persuasion has another meaning. It means a tendency, like a habit in one direction or another to do something or to think something. Uh, in a usual way for the person. So the persuasion of giving him the choice of topic can mean that Anne, as usual, let the other person decide what to talk about. Uh, and he chose a topic to discuss which his usual companions had probably no concern in. So like the people in his life probably had no desire to talk to him about this subject. Uh, so after already letting him choose the topic of conversation, uh, Anne had the hope of being of real use to him in some suggestions as to the duty and benefit of struggling against affliction. Affliction here means affliction of the heart, which means sorrow, which means heartbreak. Uh, so she hoped to be able to give him good suggestions about uh, why the duty. Uh, and the benefit of not wallowing in your heartbreak, of trying to overcome your heartbreak, uh, which had naturally grown out of their conversation. So she's not just jumping in with advice. She's trying to give advice uh, that grows naturally from their conversation. Uh, for though shy, he did not seem reserved. So he looks shy, but Reserve means OK, shy means uh, you don't take the initiative to talk to other people. You, you wait until someone talks to you. Reserved means when someone talks to you, you don't say a lot. You don't share a lot of yourself. So though shy, he did not seem reserved. So like he doesn't talk to other people directly uh, on his own, but if someone talks to him, he's willing to talk to them. Instead, it had rather the appearance of feelings glad to burst their usual restraints. 
So it seems like he's waiting for someone to talk to him so that he can share everything that he feels. Uh, the usual restraints probably refers to social etiquette or, or uh, being polite. Like I'm sure you always you know that kind of person who always talks about what they want to talk about and they don't care what other people say or how they react. And that's not polite. That's not etiquette. That's not following the usual restraints. But now that Benwick has someone who talks to him about something he is interested in, he doesn't have to hold back. He can say whatever is on his mind. Continuing. And having talked of poetry, the richness of the present age, which means like how good literature is today. Uh, and gone through a brief comparison of opinion as to the first rate poets. So he and Anne compare who they think are the best poets. Uh, and in doing this comparison, they try to ascertain or you know, try to determine, try to see whether Marmion or the Lady of the Lake were to be preferred. I think these are all poems, right? It tells us titles of romantic poems by Sir Walter Scott and Lord Byron. These are very in, uh, famous poets even today. Uh, so they're discussing whether Marmion or the Lady of the Lake were to be preferred and how ranked the Jower and the Bride of Abydos. So like, oh, how good are they? And moreover, how the Jower was to be pronounced. <laughs> good question. Uh, because most poetry, of course, is written at the time, published in books. So when you come across this word, how do you say it? is also something that they are talking about, like as a friend, part of their friendly conversation. Uh, he showed himself so intimately acquainted with all the tender songs of the one poet and all the impassioned descriptions of hopeless agony of the other. So the one and the other, the one means the former, the first, the, the latter means the the latter, sorry, the other means the latter, the second. So the one is Walter Scott, the other is Lord Byron. So he showed that he is very familiar with the tenderness of Sir Walter Scott and the passion of hopeless agony of Lord Byron. So notice this, he himself it has lost his fiance, and he is familiar with tenderness and passionate, hopeless agony. Seems like these poems are saying something to him, sharing his emotions. Maybe that's why he likes them so much. Uh, let's take a short break. Uh, I'm going to keep recording, so please behave.
OK, I'm back. Uh, let's let's continue. Um, let's see, where were we? Poetry and prose. OK, so. Um, Captain Benwick, who is very sad at the moment, tends to read poetry that is tender or passionately hopeless and full of agony. Uh, continuing, he repeated with such tremulous feeling the various lines which imaged a broken heart. Image here means to give an image of a broken heart. I have to warn you though that this, the word image is not usually used like this. Uh, a lot of you, when you're writing like compositions, you want to say like, the uh, xiang as a noun. Uh, you, it's hard to do that. It, the word imagination is is the ability to imagine. So you might have to say uh, as he imagined it, ru ta xiang xiang, or something like that. There's really no no. Uh, the word image is not used in that way either. The word image is usually used as uh, um, what is it in Chinese? Jing xiang. No, 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 it's uh, 意象, 意象. That's what image usually sometimes means. Uh, unless you have an actual image in front of your eyes. Uh, so this verb use of image is not uh, a common usage. Uh, but anyways, he was able to repeat with feeling the lines of poetry about a broken heart or about a mind destroyed by wretchedness. Wretchedness here can mean things like uh, uh, being in a bad situation or like being down, being low. Uh, so lines of poetry about someone whose mind is destroyed by being uh, low in spirits or low emotionally. <clears throat> uh, and as he did uh, repeat these lines, he looked so entirely as if he meant to be understood. Uh, which means it seems like he's trying to express himself using these lines of poetry, which means he's, he's probably saying uh, the idea is that these lines of poetry say exactly what he himself feels. Uh, entirely here means exactly or completely. <clears throat> so it, it looks so much like he's trying to uh, say that these poems say what he wants to say that Anne ventured to hope he did not always read only poetry. Uh, venture to hope here means uh, she said, I hope you do not only read poetry. Like she actually said it to him. The word venture here means, well, uh, it usually means to try, but here it means like she, she tentatively said, she carefully said. <clears throat> And to say that she thought it was the misfortune of poetry to be seldom safely enjoyed by those who enjoyed it completely. Uh, so she can she continues by saying that, oh, it's too bad for poetry that the people who uh, enjoy it completely usually cannot enjoy it safely. That's interesting. What does it mean to enjoy poetry safely or not safely? Uh, she continues to kind of explain this. She says, uh, and that the strong feelings which alone could estimate it truly, it means poetry. So, uh, continuing, were the very feelings which ought to taste it but sparingly. So, the idea here is that you could only tell if poetry is good or not if you yourself are familiar with the emotion that the poem is trying to convey to you. So these are the strong feelings that could estimate it truly. Estimate means to judge, to appreciate, to value or evaluate. So you need strong feelings to tell whether a poem is good, but these very feelings, the same feelings, uh, to taste it, ought to taste it, but sparingly. 
which means that if you read poetry with strong emotion, you're not, you shouldn't do it all the time. Sparingly means occasionally, rarely. Uh, and taste, of course, here means to partake or to 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 taste or to use. Um, to like try out. So why might it be dangerous? For someone with similar strong feelings to read poetry that tries to convey the same strong feelings. Why is that not safe? Um, well, let's think about this. I don't know whether you have experienced reading powerful poetry, but uh, a good powerful poem uh, can really like when it when it says when when they say that poetry conveys emotion, it's not simply like you sit there and read the poem and you feel something. Really powerful emotion can hit you so hard. Um, today, like the most common form of poetry is uh, music, songs. So you can think about what it feels like to hear uh, an emotionally powerful song. Uh, and then imagine what it would be like for you to hear that emotionally powerful song when you yourself are experiencing similar powerful emotions. Uh, I think for most people in that situation, they would simply break down and cry um, because the emotions added together are too powerful to handle. Um, and I think that's the similar logic that Anne is talking about uh, when she's talking about Captain Benwick's reading of poetry. Um, <clears throat> Hang on, I, I need to go turn on the fan. It's so hot. OK, continuing. Oh, great. I see more people have arrived. Great. OK. Um, so that's what um, Anne is talking about when she's talking about the uses of poetry, how poetry affects us, how we can read poetry uh, for our own benefit. Uh, so perhaps one way is to not wallow in those powerful emotions too much. What about prose? Let's continue. Um, so she advises him to read such powerful poetry uh, sparingly, rarely. Continuing. His looks showing him not pained, but pleased with this allusion to his situation. So the danger here is that, or well, Anne is, is afraid that if she mentions uh, his sad situation, he might feel even more sad. But it turns out uh, that's not the case because his expression, his looks, his facial expression shows him not pained, which means he's not made even more sad, but pleased with this reference or allusion to his situation. And so because of this, uh, continuing, Anne was emboldened to go on, which means she has more courage to continue. And feeling in herself the right of seniority of mind, because she is older in emotional intelligence, she has the right, she feels, to give this kind of advice. She ventured, again, opened her mouth to try to say, to recommend a larger allowance of prose in his daily study. Uh, so suggesting to him that he should read a little less poetry, a little more prose, sanwenti. Uh, and this language, a larger allowance in his daily study. This is actually the language of nutrition. So today we would say you, you uh, should have a larger allowance of protein in your daily meals. 
因为每天进食应该增加蛋白质 ，something like that. Right, allow means to let someone have. Uh, allowance today, another meaning is uh, the the money that a, a parent gives a child every week, ling yong chen, and uh, it follows the same idea of allowing the child to have this much money. So she recommends that he read more prose. And on being requested to particularize, which means to give details, uh, she mentions such works of our best moralists. Um, so here we get into a short mention of different kinds of prose literature. One kind of prose literature is people who write to uh, improve the reader's morals, to talk to the reader about what is right, what is wrong, what we should do in society. These people are called moralists. <clears throat> so she mentioned such works of our best moralists, such collections of the finest letters, such memoirs of characters of worth and suffering. So memoirs, Hui uh, Lu. The idea is that only memoirs of good people whose experiences are good for us uh, are worth reading. Now today that's not true anymore, right? Sometimes we see memoirs of like famous people or uh, people who are not famous, but infamous, notorious. And those memoirs also sell pretty well. Uh, but the original idea was to learn from the good experiences of good people. Uh, so she recommends these kinds of prose literature uh, as occurred to her at the moment as calculated to rouse and fortify the mind by the highest precepts and the strongest examples of moral and religious endurances. So here it says the reason that she recommends these authors is because she calculates, she thinks that these are the best works that could rouse and fortify the mind by the highest precepts. So precept here means idea, especially a moral idea. So these works, she believes, can give the best moral ideas to rouse and fortify the mind. Rouse means to awaken. As if Captain Benwick's mind is asleep or like wallowing in his own sorrow, is not fully awake and clear. So she's saying these words can awaken his mind and strengthen his mind, fortify, strengthen. And also because uh, these are the strongest examples of moral and religious endurances. So to endure means to like withstand difficulty. Uh, so endurance here means an example of someone who has endured. <clears throat> so uh, these probably refer to like the memoirs of characters of worth and suffering, especially the suffering part. They have endured suffering. Um, so here we see that the the way that Anne thinks of prose is as if prose literature is the author directly speaking to the reader and like whatever the author says, the reader should take in and learn. <clears throat> So kind of like how what we're doing today, right? I'm telling you uh, my ideas about this work and you are hopefully taking notes, listening, and uh, I hope learning something. Um, but is this the only way to use poetry and prose? To me, it seems like uh, these uses are kind of limited. Um, Let's talk about prose first because I'm, you're probably more familiar with prose. Prose includes novels, fiction, stories. So aside from reading these stories and essays in order to learn what the author tells us or even to learn what some characters tell us, what other reasons might we have for reading these things? Well, the most direct one, the most obvious one is for personal enjoyment. We read something because it's fun. Um, and, you know, maybe we're bored or maybe uh, we have a lot of pressure to do something else, a lot of stress. So we read something enjoyable and fun to distract us 
to take our minds off of the hard things we have to do. Um, and that's certainly one kind of use of prose, right? It's it's called escapism, escape, taobi. Uh, but uh, escapism, it used to be a bad word, right? Taobi uh, But now it slowly has a, a more and more positive meaning because, well, I mean, the world is hard. It's a hard place to be. Everyone needs a break once in a while. And that's what escapism is. Uh, are there other uses of prose? Uh, Anne mentions learning from good people. Can we learn from bad people or, or bad situations or bad events? I think so. Um, if you read a book with a character who is just horrible, an absolutely terrible person, uh, we can also learn uh, what not to do. And it's not as simple as saying don't do this. Like a lot of times uh, bad behaviors are not uh, like one complete set. Like if you avoid all of these behaviors, it's fine. A lot of the time uh, a behavior is bad, not because of the behavior itself, but because of the context, the reason or the environment for the behavior. So oftentimes when we say like, you know, learn what not to do, we're not just saying what behaviors to avoid. We're also saying what behaviors to avoid in what situations and for what reasons. So in fact, learning what not to do is not just like uh, as Anne is talking about the good people, right? You read and you remember. It's also about learning how to to uh, analyze and interpret situations, relationships, and within each changing interaction and changing relationship to tell what is a good thing to do and what is not a good thing to do. <clears throat> so that's something that we can use literature for or use prose literature for. What else? Uh, I realize that I teach literature, so this answer may go on for a while. Um, we can also read prose literature and also poetry as well for the style, for the use of language. Um, language is how we communicate, but it's also how we think. If you think about something, you have to use language to think about it. So some people have said that, in fact, the language that you know limits what you can think. If you don't have a word for a concept or you don't know how to describe something, you don't really understand that concept or that thing. Some people say. Um, and this is certainly true in terms of uh, politics. Uh, for example, today we have words like gay, homosexual, LGBT, and we know uh, what that means. But in the past, before they had these kinds of words, uh, it was hard for someone or it was harder for someone to understand why a person would like someone of the same sex in a romantic way uh, if it, it was going to be impossible for them to naturally have children together. Um, and so it is because of the rise of uh, these newer words that we start to understand that uh, romantic relationships uh, can also be formed regardless of natural reproductive processes. So that's just one example. Or like another example is like the word feminism. Uh, why do we need this word? What does it say to us? Um, in the past, or even like in many places today, uh, some people or most people think that it is natural that a man is more important or that uh, a man and a woman each have different roles to play and that they should not uh, play the other gender's roles. Uh, things like that. The word feminism gives us a way to talk about uh, or to, to examine whether these ideas make sense, whether it still makes sense to say that men are more important than women, uh, especially because in today's society, men and women have the same rights and also often have the same jobs and the same duties, the same things they need to do. Um, and without the word feminism, it's it, it's easy to like discuss individual cases and individual issues without 
understanding that they're all talking about the same problem, which is the status and role of women in society. So like language helps us to think. Now back to the question. If you read something that has uh, a creative use of language or a stylish use of language, uh, understanding what that language means can also help us to think in new and more creative ways or even in completely different ways. Uh, and learning to think in creative in different ways can open up new possibilities in our daily life for doing things in new ways or entering into different kinds of relationship with people, interacting with people in different ways. Uh, in short, it helps us to live a, a more diverse, open kind of life full of more possibilities. And if we really want to talk about this, why is it important uh, to have a life full of possibility? Because life changes. Nothing stays the same. What works for you now, what makes you happy now, may not work for you in the future, may not make you happy in the future. So one of the most important things that education can do for you is to give you more possibilities so that when things in life change, it is possible for you to change along with life, to find a new way of leading a good life. And that's part of what literature can do on a very direct level, giving you new words and new ways of expressing yourself uh, gives you new possibilities for change in case you want or need to change. Uh, both poetry and prose can do this. Uh, let's see, are there any poss other possible uses of uh, literature like prose and poetry? Um, yes, that's right. Uh, and here we're talking about uh, what it means to be cultured, which is what I was just talking about for five minutes. Uh, another use is, and this is like the last one that I can, well, no, I can think of two more. The, the one I can think of is it can help you get a job to teach literature. Yeah, you need to know literature to teach literature. Uh, right, so the other reason I can think of is that um, it gives you an, a window or a door to a community of people who also enjoy reading. So if you enjoy uh, what poetry and prose can give you, like that experience uh, or the knowledge or the feeling or as uh, your classmate mentioned, the culture that uh, literature can give you. You might also enjoy talking about literature or enjoying literature together with other people who think and feel the same as you do. A sense of community. Uh, and this is really important because uh, everyone has different ha uh, hobbies and different tastes, different interests. So it, you can't just say, uh, oh, you know, if you don't have a, if you can't find a literature community, you can always join another community. Um, because for some people, the other community may not be as powerful or as supportive as the literature community. So the fact that we can read literature and talk about literature and share our ideas about literature with other people is also another way that we can use poetry and prose to help us be more social, to find our community, to find a sense of community and a sense of belonging. All of these ideas, community, belonging, uh, are what is meant by the word identity, senfen. To find your identity means to understand who you are, what kind of person you are, and what kind of people are your people? What kind of community you can feel like you belong to? You can call a kind of home uh, where you feel like uh, life welcomes you. So that's also something important that literature can do. Of course, not just literature, any kind of hobby or interest can help you find a community. But without a, a literature community, uh, people who love literature would have a more difficult time in life. So that's another use. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. Anyways, like the, the, the number, the sheer number of uses of literature I've been talking about shows you 
how limited Anne's understanding of literature is. Um, and we should remember that in the novel, Anne is simply like a wiser, kinder person. She is not a genius. Her values are to a great extent still the values of her community. Um, she perhaps has a bit more learning, a bit more culture. She has a better personality, uh, but she is not like a particularly uh, smart or like ingenious person. So when she talks about literature in this way, it's safe to think that most people of that time period also thought of literature in this way, uh, that poetry helps to guide the feelings and prose helps to guide the mind. Uh, and both help you to become a better person. Um, OK, moving on. Last question. Anne hopes that Louisa's accident will prompt Captain Wentworth to reconsider the absolute value of having firmness of character in terms of comparing Anne and Louisa. So in, in simple English, what this means is Louisa has an accident. And she has the accident. She falls to the ground because she is so willful and wants to enjoy like jumping into Captain Wentworth's arms from a high place. It's something she wants to do that she personally wants to do. It has nothing to do with like social etiquette or the proper thing to do. She's simply having fun. Uh, and so one way to understand this is to say that she has a firmness of character. If she wants to do something, nobody can stop her. She is firm. Now, Captain Wentworth has said that he desires a, a woman with the firmness of character, and that's why he originally uh, fell in love with Anne, because Anne is also in some ways uh, this kind of person. If she feels like something is right, she will do it, and nobody can stop her. Uh, so Anne hopes that uh, now that Louisa, who is supposed to that he has a firmness of character, has an accident because of her firmness of character, maybe Captain Wentworth will reconsider whether having a firmness of character is in fact the, the most important thing to seek in a woman. And Anne hopes that he will reconsider because if he reconsiders, he would no longer be interested in Anne and Anne would no longer have to worry about whether he still likes her, how to behave around him, what will their future be together? Will they have a future together? All of these complicated questions would be resolved if uh, Louise's accident changes Captain Wentworth's mind about what is valuable in a woman. That's the question, or that's the background of the question. The question is, do you think such a comparison between Anne and Louisa in terms of their firmness of character might make sense? Why or why not? So let's look at uh, page 78. Uh, let's see, where is this? Ah, OK, so uh, Louisa has had her accident and after uh, she is or Louisa has been taken away to be taken care of. Now Captain Wentworth is regretting uh, letting Louisa jump into his arms. He says. Don't talk of it, don't talk of it, he cried. Cry doesn't mean tears, cry means shout. Oh God, that I had not. Oh, OK, so maybe not shout. Cry means an outburst of emotion. This can be loud. It can also be like a normal volume. But it's talking that is not within the usual bounds of social etiquette. It's an outburst of emotion. So here he says, don't talk of it, don't talk of it. Oh God, that I had not given way to her at the fatal moment. Had I done as I ought, but so eager and so resolute. Dear sweet Louisa. OK, so here he's saying he should not have given way to her at the fatal moment. When the last time she wanted to jump into his arms, he should not have let her. He should have said, no, it's dangerous. Twice is enough. Uh, no more. Had I done as I ought. So this uh, sentence structure basically means if I had done. 
假设语气。Uh, so the second half of the sentence is missing, right? It's something like, had I done as I ought, she would not have fallen and hit her head. Something like that. So basically he's saying, I wish I had done what I should have done, which is stopped her from jumping again. But so eager and so resolute talking about Louisa, I should have stopped her, but she was so eager and she was so determined that I could not help but let her. So that's why Anne says. Uh, Anne wondered whether it ever occurred to him now to question the justness, which means the rightness or how right it is of his own previous opinion as to the universal felicity and advantage of firmness of character. So he used to think that having a firmness of character is universal means always. Felicity means goodness, so it's always good and advantage, which means it's always better uh, in terms of like being a person or like being a wife or whatever. So he used to think previous opinion that it is always good and better for a woman to have a firmness of character. But now, now that he himself has said that this happened because Louisa is so resolute, so determined, so firm, now Anne wonders whether uh, he would change his mind about this, uh, this opinion of women. Uh, so does it make sense? Would it make sense for him to change his mind about this? Let's let's compare this. Anne, sorry, first Louisa. Louisa displays a firmness of character in terms of she wants to have fun and nobody can stop her. Anne displayed a firmness of character mainly in terms of uh, breaking her engagement with Captain Wentworth because her family was opposed. Uh, so uh, her family does not want them to get married because like Captain Wentworth is poor and is not a noble. Uh, and Anne listens to her family uh, and just breaks up with him. Now, Louisa does this because she wants to have fun and also because like she likes Captain Wentworth. Anne does it because um, we can say it's because marriage is not simply a question between two people. It is a marriage of two families. Right. Remember when Sir Walter Elliot is thinking about Charles Musgrove, whom Mary uh, marries, and they always think that it's a pity that Charles Musgrove is not a noble, that he only has money. Uh, or think of like uh, Charles Hayter, whom Henrietta wants to marry, a poor commoner. Nobody in, in the Elliot family, uh, except for maybe Anne, thinks that it is a good idea. So marriage is between two families, not just between two people. In that sense, when every person in Anne's family opposes her marriage to Captain Wentworth, it does seem like she should break up with him. Or, you know, like if uh, the idea of an engagement is that we will be married soon. So if it looks like you're not going to be married, it's not right to keep an engagement. It's more proper to break off the engagement if you're not certain of marriage. And if you're not certain of marriage, you at this time you probably shouldn't even uh, be romantically involved with someone. Like sure you can go out as friends like uh, Captain Wentworth and Louisa are doing now, uh, but you can't like be too intimate uh, because first of all, people will think, oh, you're maybe you're getting married soon. And secondly, it might mislead you and uh, the person you're with into thinking that maybe you will get married. It's it's um, uh, in Chinese we would call this qing si bi ren qiang. So it's it's uh, better to avoid that kind of situation if you're not absolutely sure. So it seems like Anne's firmness of character and Louisa's firmness of character are actually completely different. Uh, Louisa is firm in her own happiness and her own uh, like joy in what she wants to do. But Anne is firm in doing what she believes is the right thing to do, even if it causes her great unhappiness. 
So if this question is asking, uh, do you think such a comparison might make sense between Anne and Louisa's firmness of character? Uh, well, I mean, we just compared them, so of course the comparison makes sense. But in terms of whether Captain Wentworth should change his mind about a woman having firmness of character because of Louisa's accident, I think he should not. Because Louisa's firmness of character is very different from Anne's firmness of character. So uh, looking at the case of Louisa doesn't really tell us a lot about the case of Anne. I believe Captain Wentworth should not use the case of Louisa to judge his situation with Anne because they're two very different situations. OK, those are the questions. Uh, do you want to ask me anything so far? Yes, uh, having a sense of community can also help you learn from others. That is true. Uh, other questions? OK, so uh, let's take attendance. So as you can see, we will take attendance. Uh, I said in the letter to you guys that um, I would uh, like download some lists. Apparently that's a different version of Microsoft Teams that we I don't have a an attend attendance sheet. So you're going to have to uh, click this form and then hit submit uh, on the main menu. So um, Do you see it? Uh, OK, let me check. You can know, ma'am. No, I'll see. 呃，就是你左边频道要选general 这个频道。general，and then go to the bottom。啊，嗯，呃，okay， so let me first. Uh, okay, so if you don't see the form, uh, please like just reply to the conversation of the meeting and just say like you're here. Is it is it Hong Yu Hui Ma? Hong Yu Wei? Yeah, okay. So I know you're here. Fine. That's that's good. Okay. Thank you. Uh, sure. Everyone else, if you for some reason cannot click the form, it should be a total of 32 people to vote. If you cannot click the form, just reply. Yeah, thank you. Just like this. Just say that you're here. Uh, and let's confirm uh, who we have. Let's see. Uh, uh, the design is very weird. I can't confirm directly using Teams. I have to log in to Microsoft Forms. Hi, OK, so. Um, let's see all forms. Where is spa? OK, if you see your student number, you have su successfully signed in.
OK, that's it. If you do not see your student number, please comment uh, below the meeting conversation to tell me that you are in fact here. I didn't see my num I student ID number. OK, then please leave a comment below our uh, in the discussion to tell me you're here. Uh, next week, I'll take attendance. Uh, geez, like I, I want to find a way to not record this part. Uh, but if I stop the recording now, the video gets divided into two videos. Uh, next week, I'll take attendance at 437. OK, so at the end of class. Uh, OK, so hi. Yes, I see you. Great. 30. Yeah, so everyone's here. OK, great. Uh, OK, so let's. I know, don't worry, I know everyone's here. I'll check your name also, don't worry. Uh, OK, so let's go back to uh, the beginning of today's selection. What is it, chapter nine? Oh, this is chapter nine. OK, great. So. Um, you're welcome. OK, chapter nine. Uh, um, OK. Uh, Captain Wentworth was come to Kellynch as to a home. Yeah, yeah, we're going until uh, 440, right? As the schedule says. OK, OK, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> So Captain Ken, uh, Wentworth was come to Kellynch as to a home, so not as a visitor, to stay as long as he liked, being as thoroughly the object of the Admiral's fraternal kindness as of his wife's. So fraternal means brother, brotherly. So which means even though he, he is only uh, Lady Croft's brother, the Admiral also treats him like a brother. So he is able to call Kellynch uh, his home while the Admiral is renting it. Continuing, he had intended on first arriving to proceed very soon into Shropshire and visit the brother settled in that county. Uh, so he was going to visit his brother, but the attractions of Uppercross induced him to put this off. Now remember Uppercross is where Mary and uh, Charles Musgrove live, so he's attracted to go visit Uppercross instead. There was so much of friendliness and of flattery and of everything most bewitching in his reception there. So he, he finds it attractive because everyone is friendly. Everyone thinks he's a good guy uh, and it was just a lot of fun. The old, the old people were so hospitable, which means welcoming. The young so agreeable that he could not but resolve to remain where he was and take all the charms and perfections of Edward's wife upon credit a little longer. Uh, Edward is his brother in Shropshire, so to take something on credit means a credit here means xing yong, as in like a credit card. A credit card you pay for it later. So here it means uh, he heard about the charms and perfections of Edward's wife. For now he'll have to take Edward's word for it. He'll confirm later, which means he'll visit them later. It was soon upper cross with him almost every day. Now, when we read to this point, we can see that there might be a problem because who else is staying at upper cross? Anne, Anne who really doesn't want to run into him and whom he probably doesn't want to run into either, but uh, she's staying at upper cross and he visits every day. Something's going to happen. The Musgroves could hardly be more ready to invite than he to come. So they want to invite him. He wants to go. Particularly in the morning when he had no companion at home for the Admiral and Mrs. Croft were generally out of doors together, interesting themselves in their new possessions, their grass and their sheep and dawdling about in a way not endurable to a third person or driving out in a gig lately added to their establishment. So he likes to go in the morning because in the morning Admiral and Mrs. Croft are not at home. 
what are they doing? They're enjoying all the property that comes with Kellynch, right? The grass, the sheep, and to dawdle about means to spend time together doing nothing. And they do this together in a way that a third person would not feel welcome. So basically the third person would be like a fifth wheel. Uh, like today we say like uh, to uh, a couple spending like going on a date together, uh, the, a third person would be very unwelcome. That kind of idea. So they're doing this or they're driving out in a gig. A gig is a, a small, fast carriage. Like today we have all different kinds of cars, right? A sedan, SUV, a van. Uh, back when they were all using horse drawn carriages, they had also different kinds of carriages. Uh, and here uh, they're talking about a, one of them, which is a gig, uh, which they also added to their establishment, which means they recently bought it. Uh, so they might even be driving around. So basically they're not home. And so that's why Captain Wentworth likes to go to Uppercross in the morning. Hitherto, which means up to this point, there had been only one opinion of Captain Wentworth, but here means only. Among the Musgroves and their dependencies. Dependency means people who depend on them. Now the Musgroves are not nobles, so their dependents are not like tenants and farmers. It means like uh, the older Mr. and Mrs. Charles Musgrove. Uh, are they Musgroves? I can't remember. Like the, the grandparents or their children or their relatives or their domestic workers like nannies and gardeners. Everybody only has one opinion of Captain Wentworth. It was unvarying, the same opinion. Warm admiration everywhere. But things change when Charles Hayter uh, comes back to visit Uppercross. Um, and uh, we're out of time, so we're not talking about this. Uh, see you the same time next week. I'm ending the recording now.